The reason that Mount St. Joseph was built was that at that time, it was before the Vatican Council, and each religious order had its own seminary. And after the war, the Carmelites here were part of the Irish problems, and men came from Ireland to California and then went back again. But after the war, Rome asked the order to spread in the English-speaking territories. Ireland then opened missions in Philippines and in Australia. And the provincial told the men here that we won't be able to send you any more men. So you better start developing your own vocations. So that was the impetus. And uh, they, they sent Father Edward out and uh, he was put in charge of the development then. And so he bought Oakville with the help of Noel Sullivan, who was the brother of Mother Agnes, who was the prioress in Santa Clara convent. And that went very well. And after a while they did a lot of vocations and they realized that the next stage is the seminary, the teaching philosophy and theology. So Father Edward then started looking around and uh, came down to San Jose, thought it would be good here. And with the help of the nuns in, in, uh, in Santa Clara, the financial help, he was able to buy the property here. And Father Edward looked around and then he found this beautiful spot overlooking the city of San Jose and was owned by a widow Mrs. D'Amico. She was Sicilian and Father Edward, who had studied in Rome, spoke Italian fluently and they became great friends. And so she was happy then that it was going to be a seminary, but she wanted to dedicate to San Antonio, to Saint Anthony. That, she wanted, that was her great devotion. But Father Edward wanted dedicated to St. Joseph, to whom he had a tremendous love and affection. And so they, they battled over that and she wouldn't give in. So in the end, Father Edward said, well, the reason we want to dedicate to St. Joseph is that the Holy Father, the Pope, wants it dedicated to St. Joseph. So she said then, as a good Italian who loved the Pope, well, if the Pope wants it, that's okay. So that's how it became dedicated to, to Saint Mount, called Mount St. Joseph. And Father Dominic and Father, later Father, well, Father Edward and then later Father Dominic came to live in the, the D'Amico home, which is that little house down near the entrance. And they lived there, and then Father, Brother Christopher, Christopher Soberanis came to live there too. And they were there for over four years. And in the meantime, they were collecting funds and also building up here. And Father Edward got tremendous help from, uh, especially the pastor, Father Cook, down at St. John Vianney. And from the people there, and a lot of the Italian and the Mexican and the Irish club, Father Edward drew on them a lot. And they were so generous and so good, people like the the Pascalis and so many others. I came down to visit the place when it was being built. There was a lot of activity going on. But then for the feast of St. John of the Cross, which was in November at that time, the place was opened. Father Edward wants to have it on some significant Carmelite feast day. So it started then as a, like an independent seminary. Then after the council, the American bishops decided that having these small little seminaries was not a good idea. That the quality of the education they felt wasn't up to the standard. 
and also they weren't able to the grant degree, degree, university degrees. So then we had to start sending the students to uh, Santa Clara University. The general, Father Camillo, was on a pastoral visitation and he didn't like the idea that we had a house for novices and also here, even though the students weren't being taught here. So he changed here to become the novitiate. And then Oakville was kind of left abandoned. Kind of, but then Oakville became then a house of prayer and like a small retreat house. But here then became the novitiate, the, the first year and a half of the students was here. And so it took on a different, not a scholastic atmosphere, but a, one way I say a piety, piety, <laughs> and where the novices were trained here. And then in the year of St. Teresa Centennial, we were blessed with a wonderful class, a big class of novices again. Other times we had you know, sporadic numbers and so on. But it was a big class come up again. It was like an almost a rebirth of it. And that's the way it's been since. But looking back, you can see like God's providence. But God is essentially working through the help of the nuns and the tremendous help of the lay people. And that has developed. Now we have a lot of the Filipinos and Vietnamese and even Chinese. But still, the some of the, the old, they're getting more or less old now, the Irish group and the Mexican group and the Italian group. So we're, we're really depending so much on the, the support and the prayers of so many others. And uh, I hope, please God, that that will continue. And it looks like it is. And thank God we're getting good vocations again. So what draws me to serve God as a Carmelite are three things, um, religious consecration, silent prayer, and preaching. So all that is Carmel. So God has been stirring me to himself uh, towards religious life for several, several years now. And I'm being drawn to our Lord Jesus Christ in religious consecration in poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's, that's, I see that as a great gift from God, a gift to His love that I've been embracing and trying to give thanks to God for that. And Carmel, that's a reality. Carmel also has, of course, the great means, the great love of silent prayer. St. Teresa of Avila actually said that the raison d'etre of Carmelite life is prayer. So I could, that makes sense to me, that corresponds to me. Um, that encounter with our Lord specifically, that prayer of in silence and solitude is a unique and privileged encounter that I find that God, that God gets me. And so I want to commit my life to that. I want to commit my life to our Lord in silent prayer. In Carmel, in, as a discalced Carmelite here, that's a reality. And then of course, Carmelites, with their love of prayer, they're also drawn, like St. Elijah and so many other leaders and fathers of the Carmelite order, they're called to that ministry, they're called to that preaching ministry, specifically that prophetic vocation. So contemplative vocation and prophetic vocation. This reality of Carmel, um, this, this honorable, holy religious family, this gift, is what I'm seeking. So I ask for your prayers as I embark on this beautiful path 
towards our Lord Jesus Christ and our Lady's Order. Thanks be to God. I suppose I should say first and foremost, I fell in love with the writings of John on the Cross, but then I was very impressed with the order itself and the mixture of the prayer and the apostolate. So I like very much that aspect of living a life devoted to God, a life of prayer, and at the same time the Carmelite order has a very nice mixture with the apostolate, so I have the opportunity not just to uh, live a life of love of God, but also to bring other people into it with me. Concerning the life of prayer as a Carmelite, it's a mixture of praying in common, uh, the prayers of the church, we're together, the holy sacrifice, the mass, the hours, the office, uh, adoration, the blessed sacrament. Um, but at the same time, then there's also that time of what often is just called private prayer. Um, not a number of orders don't have that. They really stress the apostolic work, and which is very valuable. We need orders like that. But I think um, to really make something fruitful, you need to have that that uh, life of personal prayer and communication with God. That's why I was really attracted to John of the Cross writing about perpetual prayer, you know, always being a state of union with God and not the aspect of always having to say something, but just having that awareness of His presence. Um, that's something particularly you will see um, in the Carmelite spirituality, although it's something that everyone is called to. The friars themselves impressed me greatly. Um, I saw them in their robes and um, with all the preconceived notions of religious life that I had, it kind of blew them. They were not uh, what I expected them to be. They were uh, normal, <laughs> very, very normal guys. Um, but truly who they were. There was a authenticity. They were genuine, they were down to earth. Um, and getting to know them better, truly spiritual. And I would dare say truly holy. Because seeing them in their day-to-day -day lives, being who they are, and having it be so natural that they are so steeped in the Spirit, so steeped in the things of God. Um, there's nothing preachy or uh, fake or two-faced about it. You saw what you got. And that's one thing that drew me to want to be among their number. Uh, and this I came to find was due to the prayer life. Because when a person is so steeped in prayer and they're basking in the light of God, in the light of truth, God's truth, being in His presence reveals one's presence, oneself, gives one the truest self-knowledge and allows them to respond, respond to the generous love of God, um, and respond from the depth of their being, because it's from those depths that one encounters God. And then to have that pour forth, pour forth like water from the rock. That's one of the things that 
really attracted me. Father James from the Carmelite House of Prayer in Oakville, and I'd like to discuss some aspects of prayer with Father Edward. Father Edward was born over 70 years ago in Ireland. He has been in the Carmelite Order for over 50 years, and he has been in California for over 30 years. So Father will have a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom to share with us. And we would particularly like to discuss with him the question of prayer. Now, Father, I've, a few years ago, you entered the Carmelite Order as a young man in Ireland. Why did you pick the Carmelite Order? Or would you like to tell us about your vocation to this particular order? <clears throat> well, I suppose it's, it's very hard to answer that question in a convincing fashion, except to say that I suppose... Uh, our way of life uh, for all of us is planned by God and I often think of um, uh, of something that I saw on television in England a little while ago about Malcolm Muggeridge and he volunteered the kind of information that together with what's happening in our ordinary life there's another life um, process going on a hidden process at work and uh, sometimes unknown to us maybe also frustrated by us too because we want to uh, carry out what we think we should do and yet uh, this other life process is at work and it has God for its um, inspiration and directing direction and um, eventually that comes to the surface and we begin to see things in retrospect then that that was the way that God wanted it for us that would be kind of a general remark however getting down to specifics uh, I can never remember a time when I didn't want to be a priest I, I don't say that I wanted to be a Carmelite uh, however when I was uh, exposed to the Carmelite order a little through the services and the friendship of a of a nun of the presentation order who knew my family I, I began to take a great interest in the Carmelite order although I have to admit that I didn't know very much about uh, and the life that Carmelites lived at that time except that uh, I knew it was more perfect than than the normal way of life that a priest might live in the parish or in another religious order.